This morning, we are delighted to introduce to you our preacher, Dr. George Yancey. He is a sociologist, and uh, his academic interests are uh, race relations and anti-Christian attitudes. And his book, his new book that was recently released, he uh, develops, it talks about really a model forward, a model that presses us forward beyond uh, colored, color blindness and uh, anti-racism. And it's, uh, it's just a privilege to have you here this morning. As I've heard you the last couple of days, I've really been taken by uh, the way you speak with uh, humility and your love, your deep abiding love for the church comes through at every point. We're grateful to have you. Come on up. Hello, everyone. So let me just start off with a question. Uh, if our faith our Christian faith means something morally. Why do we sound like everyone else when it comes to racial issues? Because don't we? Don't we just like pick a side and then we get on that side and then that's what we're doing? Now, to be fair, you know, being a Christian doesn't always mean that a difference. For example, two plus two is four no matter where you go. Christian, non-Christian, whatever. But then being a Christian means something when it comes to moral issues, does it not? Does it, does it mean how we look at moral issues, things such as sexuality and, and honesty? And, and, and shouldn't it matter when we're looking at racism? Let's unpack this, because I think that we have something to offer when it comes to this, to this important topic, which is one of the issues that's tearing us apart in this country. So. My, my, my uh, topic is, can Christianity teach us anything unique about racism? Let's get started. First, we live in a racialized society. That's a society where race matters profoundly for differences in life experiences, of opportunities, and social relationships. Race matters. If I'm pulled over by the police, they look in there, and they're going to see that there's an African American in there. Now, that matters. Now, I'm not saying that they see a black guy that's in there and they're going to get all SWAT and, you know. I'm just saying that that matters in how I'm going to be treated. It matters my life experiences, and you know what? It matters in life, your life experiences, too. No matter what your race is, it matters your life. Hey, you're a white guy? You know what it is. You go on the basketball court and people go, oh, no, I don't want the white guy. <laughs> I'll, get this, I'll get this short, fat black guy over here instead. You know, and, then, and then you find your Dirk Nowinski. Oh, y'all don't know Dirk, because we're from, I'm from Texas. Dirk Nowinski, tall, German, you know, really great. Uh, who's, who's the great white basketball player around Boston? I don't know. Oh, but, oh. <laughs> He's been retired for like 30 years. I mean, I'm, uh, you're, you're, you know. these young people have never heard of Larry Bird. I want, honestly, I taught a class once, and a uh, class of young African-American men. And I said, oh yeah, Michael Jack, no, not Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan. And they said, who's Michael Jordan? I said, you failed this class right now. <laughs> okay, we have a racialized society though. I mean, the important point is, our society is for matterly profoundly. Okay, because of this, and because of the way it matters, and because of the way it matters is that we have a history of racial abuse. No denying that. But a lot of the mechanisms that were abusive are no longer there. We no longer have slavery today. We don't have internment centers today. What do we make of this? There's two contrasting views about racism. One is racism is done, something that's overt and only done from one individual to another individual. And the solution then is what's known as colorblindness. In other words, the solution to dealing with the reality of race is we ignore race. I treat you just as if you're anyone else and I don't pay attention to your race. Your race is just something to describe you with. That's all it is. That's the notion of colorblindness and how colorblindness tries to tackle the issues of racism. The other 
racism is structural as well as individualistic. And social institutions can perpetuate racism even when individuals don't intend to be race, racist. Now, there's a lot of names that you, I can give this. I've chosen anti-racism because that's the, that's the term that's usually used. Honestly, when I wrote my book, that was the popular term. If I write in the book today, I'd probably put CRT and take all the hits for, around that because that's what everyone says, CRT, CRT, CRT. Uh, on another topic, most people talk about CRT don't know anything about CRT, but uh, that's something else again. Uh, Anti-racism. When I wrote my first book in 2006, anti-racism wasn't the term, and I didn't know what to say. And so I went to the publisher, I said, well, why don't I call this whites are evil? And the publisher says, a little harsh. <laughs> so uh, we, we wind up with white responsibility. Uh, but I think anti-racism fits today, because that's the term of art today. All right, so what I'm going to argue is that these two approaches both fail. All right? And they fail, I think, uh, for reasons that are tied to our faith. And so that's the argument I'm going to make. Uh, this pa uh, up until this point, I've stayed away from theology. I'm going to touch some theology. You know, I feel really confident up to this point because, you know, we're on my turf, social sciences, but now I'm getting ready to go on y'all's turf. And so it's going to be, it's going to, yeah, be gentle with me. Uh, first, let's, talk, let's look at colorblindness. Now, colorblindness is viable if we live in a fairly fair society. You know, if we live in a fairly fair society, then you can say, well, you know, we can just treat everyone the same and we don't have to worry about things. And some people argue that we have, you know, we, we hear the proponents of color bias say racism was a problem in the past, but now we don't have a problem today. Is that true? Well, let's look at, okay, good. We already have that up here. All right, is colorblindness viable? Here's some research. First, there's been no real decrease in racial discrimination over the past 25 years when it comes to hiring. And we know this through something called audit studies. Now, an audit study is when you take a person of color and a white person, they both apply for the same job. And then you just see who gets called back. Now, this is not a single study. What this was is what we call a meta-analysis. I'll try to keep the sociological terms to a minimum. A meta-analysis is when you take a lot of studies and you see the overall results. Now, note what this is saying. This is not saying that we still have discrimination uh, on hiring. This is this not decrease over 25 years. It's not that, well, back in 2000, 20% of the people of color did not get called back, and now it's only 10%. It's that if it's 20% 20 years ago, it's 20% today. We have racial discrimination on hiring. And the way they do these audit studies is, is that they use names. So if your name is Leroy or Juan, and you apply for a job, you're less likely to be hired to even get to even get an interview. Driving while black. Uh, this is a study. This was done in Ohio. There's been other studies in other parts of the country. Driving while black is if you're more likely to be pulled over if you're an African American, except for one point in time. There's one point in time you're not likely to be pulled over, and that's at night. Because at night you can't see in the car. Now. It may be that we blacks, that we are crazy drivers. You know, maybe we go all over the place. But here's the bad news. We're as bad of drivers as you white people. Because <laughs> when they do the research, they also note, you know, how fast cars are going, and they say, you know, or is there a reason why people are being pulled over? You know, I mean, if we did this research and say drunks are being pulled over more than non-drunks, we would say, well, of course, you know, they're all over the place. But we're just as bad as you white people. So it's not our driving. And it's not happening at night. Resident segregation. Now, I know up here in the, north, in the Northeast that you guys are much more sophisticated than us yokels in Texas. But in Texas, you know, we have the black part of town and the Hispanic part of town. I know that doesn't happen in Boston and in New York. And, you know, I, I know that, that, that you all have figured that all out. But for those of us who haven't figured that out, what we do know is that this impacts educational outcomes. Now, I... Ashley did not go to a predominantly black high school uh, for reasons I won't go into. It's not that important. It's, you know, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's not that, just not that important. I went to a predominantly Hispanic high school in the city that I was in. And there are two predominantly white high schools. There was a predominantly black high school. I just didn't happen to go that way. I went to a predominantly Hispanic high school. Uh, what was interesting was our high school sucked at everything except one thing. 
The one thing, we, in fact, we, went, we, took, we not only took steak in this every year, we kicked boutte in steak. I mean, you know, we, we tripled the points everyone has. The thing we were good in was industrial arts, building a home. We build a home, I mean, probably brick lane and masonry and all that sort of stuff, which is great. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with teaching those skills, except this is the Hispanic high school. The white high schools, they're sending their kids to college. Spank high schools, they're sending their kids to be builders. Resident segregation, sending people to different schools, and then you create these sort of dynamics. And according to this research, you know, as of 2014, it's still impacting. And, and I don't see how it would not still be today. And then the healthcare practices. Did you know during COVID, you probably knew this during COVID, that African Americans and Hispanic Americans were less likely to get the vac vaccination than European Americans? Now, why is that? Why is that? And this is after controlling for income, so it's not just an income effect. Well, part of it is there's evidence of racism in the way healthcare providers, uh, the way they treat people of color, what they prescribe. And so what happens is for, for a person of color is they don't trust the healthcare system. They don't trust the healthcare system because their experiences. You probably heard of the Tuskegee experiment where they, they uh, did not treat African Americans with syphilis. We blacks know about that. We talk about it in our communities. And so we don't trust it. Now, one of the ramifications of that, of that non-trust, is that when there is a remedy, we don't take it. And we can talk about, you should take it, and I, I agree, you know, I, well, I was about to say I got vaccinated as soon as I came. My wife made sure I got vaccinated as soon as, you know, it's sort of like that. Hey, there's a vaccination, you know, it's an hour away. You want me to drop an hour away? Yes! So that, 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 that there, yeah, that took place. But uh, that is more evidence. In other words, we do not live in a society where people are treated equally, even though we don't have slavery, we don't have praise God, we don't have internment centers, we don't have reservations where Native Americans are forced on there, although there is a history behind that. You know, you know, we can talk about that a little bit. We don't have that, but we still have an unfair society. And so when you talk about being colorblind, what you're saying is that we have these wounds and we're just going to ignore them. If you have a wound, you have to treat it. If you don't treat wounds, they get gangrene and they get festered. I have three little boys. They get wounded all the time. And my wife is right on it with all the slabbing and stuff like that because we, we've learned, you know, that if we're not right on it, sometimes it gets infected and, of course, things get worse. So a colorblind approach, you talk to a person of color and say, hey, you know, hey, you're equal today. We don't have to do anything today. And then they, li even though they don't know all this research, they live it out. You know, I've experienced uh, some of the dynamics that, that are here, even though I, even before I knew the research, you know, I've had an experience that was akin to uh, probably the uh, driving while black. So we live it out. And so when you come and say, hey, we'll just ignore it, then it's like, how are we going to deal with the wound? Okay, anti-racism. Uh, when I did, wrote my book, I read uh, many books on anti-racism. I'm going to, you know, just sort of pierce it down to things that I found in common in these books. Uh, one thing was very, being very proactive in dealing with racism, that, you know, we're going to be aggressive. We're going to be very assertive. We're, we're not going to wait for racism. We're going to deal with it. Second, just many all aspects of racism. We're, it's not just about whether or not a person's racist. Racism is systematic. It's institutional. Now, if this was all anti-racism was, I probably would call myself an anti-racist. Because I'm there on that. I'm there on being very proactive, not just assuming. I'm there on dismantling. It's the third part that is very problematic, and I think leads to a lot of problems. Responsive whites to do what people of color want. Now, if you say you're exaggerating, then give me the anti-racism book that does not do this, does not say this, because I read them. I read them in 2020. Maybe there's some that come out since then, but I read them. In some version or another, just to give you one example, in White Fragility, what D'Angelo says, you know, for whites to do, is listen to people of color and try to do better. There is, you know, we do have our history of racial abuse. There's no doubt about that. But humans don't do well having people do what they want them to do. And I'm going I'm to touch in on that a little bit more. And so this creates all sorts of issues. 
Now, is it just my opinion, or what does the research say? Next slide, please. There's research showing that approaches based on anti-racism generally do not work. For example, diversity training has little long-term effect on prejudice. We think we can go in there and we can say, hey, don't be prejudiced, don't be prejudiced, don't be prejudiced, and do all sorts of, you get a short-term bump, but then it goes back to the mean. It's kind of like when you send your kids off to Bible camp, right? Send them off, they come back on fire, make up their bed, yes ma'am, yes sir, and then three weeks later, it's bed messed up. What, ma? You know, it's, you know, it's just, you know, they're, 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 my kids are not old enough. I have seven, six, and four years. They're not old enough to send to Bible camp yet. We're hoping, we're, we're, we're ready to send them to Bible camp. Uh, but, but uh, you know, best thing we can, we can do right now is like a Mother's Day out. And we can get, you know, get, I mean, love them and, as they go off for a day or something like that. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, the stories are there. A uh, little long-term effect. Diversity training can generate a backlash against people of color. Now, it may be how we're doing it, and I think that's part of it, but the backlash means that you have whites who go into diversity training feeling a certain way, and afterwards they feel worse against people of color. So it's actually, it's, you know, the first one says it was not doing anything. The second one says it can actually make things worse. Teaching about privilege can lead to less sympathy for whites, but does not increase sympathy for, for African Americans. So when we teach people about white privilege, which does exist, which is a real thing, the way we teach it at least, or maybe even just the teaching of it, can create less sympathy for European Americans, but does not increase sympathy for marginalized people of color. That's the, that's the key. Uh, I read a subset the other day of a person who was in, in a classroom. She really had been in a classroom and the subject of white privilege came up, and everyone's, yeah, white privilege is a problem, problem. And she's, so she questioned it. She said, all right, you know, are you saying that the daughters of President Obama has it worse than these whites who were born in poverty, you know, in, 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 you know, in trailers and uh, on food stamps? That they have it worse in every single way? People say, yes. No sympathy for whites who are in marginalized situations or less sympathy. And then this study, I wish I had the time to unpack it. I did yesterday, so, uh, so if, if, uh, if, you, if you want to see it unpacked, I guess you can uh, get the thing from yesterday. But anti-racism approaches, things such as mentor diversity training, grievance committees, that sort of stuff, when you look at companies that do these things, they actually hire fewer managers of color. Not more, fewer. So how do you feel about anti-racism if it resonates with you? The fact of the matter is, it's not working. It's not working. Okay, so here's the social sciences. Now, I, I'm a Christian and I'm a scientist, uh, and so I've given the social science part, now I get to go into theology, and, and then, you know, I'm, and, and okay, here we go. All right, this is the truth that both approaches, I think, miss. Beyond the problem that both approaches miss, and, and this, go ahead, please. Human depravity. You know, when I was in grad school, uh, one of the things that just stuck out to me was how the concept of human depravity. And so, and, and you know, ever since I started talking about this, I realized that there's some nuances between different Christian traditions. But I think that this is a, this is to me one of the key differences between being a Christian and being a secularist. You know, when it comes to secular ideology, this to, you know, we can talk about, you know, do you believe in God or not, but this is a very key difference. All right, please go on. Uh, go to the next slide. This, I'm just not gonna read them, but here's some scriptures on human depravity. Uh, you can find them very easily. Just go to Google, put human depravity and scriptures, and you can find a lot of them. It is, and if you think about it, and here I'm getting a little theological, it is a core part of what being a Christian is. Because for me, uh, if I don't acknowledge human depravity, why do I need Christ? I can do it on my own. See, the, the, the key in, in, in grad school was human perfectibility. Next slide, please. Human perfectibility. My comrades in grad school basically believe that we can become perfect over time. That, you know, this is Marxism, isn't it? That when we have Marxism, we'll create a better society, a better human, a better everything. If you understand Marxism, I'm not going to dive into it. You know, you understand how, how the whole material determinism thing works and, and everything. You know, humans become better with education. Can we become better with education? We educate people right, and they're going to be better in racism, in all sorts of problems. 
humans are rational creatures who can convince become better. Now, these people obviously did not have kids because they thought humans were rational. Uh, but but that, that was, you know, rationality. Rationality moving away from myth towards rationality. This is, this is the Enlightenment movement. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to a pretty well-educated audience here, and so I don't think, you know, I, don't, I have to dive too deeply into this. And here's the thing on race. If our insight, the anti-racism and colorblindness is adopted, then we can move towards race. Both of these are saying, we're going to create this enlightened society. You adopt our position. Now, as a lot of people see this with anti-racism, they don't see this as colorblindness, but it's just as true with colorblindness. If, uh, about a, year, a couple years ago, I went to uh, that fountain of knowledge, Facebook. And I just put a question out there. You know, I'm raising three boys of color. And uh, how are you all, you know, my friends are raising kids of color. How are you dealing with, uh, you're talking about the police and, and, and things of this nature? Because, you know, my, my boys is seven, six, and four at the time. I think one was five. And we're getting to the age where I start thinking about these things. And so I just thought yeah, I'd get some of my friends, get some advice, and just, you know, weigh it and that sort of stuff. Well, I got some, but I also got a lot of pushback. From whites are saying, why are you teaching your kids about race? Why do you care, you know, about raising good black men? Just raise good men. That's what they were telling me how I should raise my kids. Because in their view, if I adopt the colorblind approach, that solves the problem. Human depravity. Humans are inherently selfish. That does nothing away with education. In fact, there's research out there by a colleague of mine that shows that among whites, the more educated they are, the more likely they are to say that they will live in a neighborhood that's integrated and send their kids to integrated schools. But they actually do it less. They're less likely to live in an integrated neighborhood, less likely to send their kids to integrated schools, the more education they have. Which makes me wonder, maybe education doesn't make us more moral. Maybe education helps us to hide our immorality better. We can answer the right way on a survey and then we live something else. Only by accounting for our desire to protect our self-interest can we deal with group conflict. Hold each other accountable can we find solutions. Human depravity affects all of us, no matter what race. So this side of heaven, we have to find ways to hold, our, hold our, each other accountable. OK, let's go to the next slide just real quick here. You know, I've called this mutual accountability, a Christian-based approach whereby we recognize that people always have a sin niche that's accounted for. Thus, everyone has to work towards healthy interracial communication to solve racial problems. I want to be very clear about this. This is the, everyone has the responsibility to work towards this. Does not mean our solutions are going to be equal, all right? It could be. Everything's on the table. It could be, but given our history of abuse, chances are that many times the solution is going to be, here's what whites need to do more than what people need to do. But you get there by communication, not by command. That's key. Because I can have the right solution and be in sin the way I, 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 I force it on people. And when people feel like they're forced, that's when you get some of the pushback on anti-racism. Next slide, please. There is uh, empirical work talking about how healthy race relations improve things uh, under the right conditions, interracial contact, it leaves bias, uh, common group identity, you know, we feel together, and when we feel that we are all united together, that increases positive feelings. Perspective taking, we don't know how to take the perspective of others, that's effective in long term. Remember, diversity training does not have long term effect, Perspective taking does. When I learn how to take the perspective of others. Cloud communication in an atmosphere of mutual support creates volitional compliance. People are working together rather than, well, I didn't have a say in this, so why should I make sure it works? Because isn't that what, it, I mean, that's, that sentence there describes a US Congress right there. I didn't have a say in this, I'm going to sabotage it. You know, Republicans and Democrats both do the same thing. Skill development. Do we develop skills? We can't just preach at people, we have to help them develop skills. And that has been shown to, to, uh, to keep when diverse training is successful, that's one of the keys that's successful. So Richard suggests that this is, is, is a healthy way. I would argue is a Christian way because it takes into consideration human depravity and how we try to adjust for it. Not perfectly, but we, we work towards that. Okay, let me just end with some implications of this. Uh, First, no one has all the right answers. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I've heard a lot of different things, and I still get things wrong. I'm still trying to learn. You know, when we feel, when we feel like we've gotten there, we should, we should be very careful. 
I'm shocked you figured it all out. Uh, we get better answers by listening to each other. We need intentional efforts at collaborative conference. It's, it's not going to happen naturally in a society like ours right now. We instead of engaging in conversations for argument, for debate, to, to score points on people, to say, yay, my team, uh, another, we have to intentionally work at it. We don't just throw people in and just have a conversation. Everyone's needs is to be respected. So we have a conversation, you know, looking for win-win solutions. Because we want everyone to feel like their needs are respected. Active listening and productive communication is valued. Uh, active listening is when I listen for understanding and not just so I can score a debate point. It's something that I do when I do my research, when I do interviews, when I interview atheists, I listen to understand them. I didn't listen to, uh, to uh, do apologetics. There's a time and place for that, but that's not that time and place for that. Uh, communication, if you do not communicate the right way, people cannot hear you. You can say the right thing, but if people feel threatened by the way you're communicating, they literally cannot hear you. Uh, and and I, you know, I don't have time, but I would go into some good examples of that. Uh, work towards solutions that are win-win instead of win-lose. That's what we gotta do. Is that different from the way that the rest of the world, the United States is doing it? Is this not a Christian approach? So why are we not doing it? This is the approach I think we're gonna need. This, and in a post-Christian world, when people are not gonna walk into our churches because our churches are there, they're gonna have to have their reason. If we start talking differently on racial issues and start having win-win approaches rather than win-lose approaches, people may say, hey, this Christianity thing, people have, they may have something to offer. Thank you.